<laughs> so anyway, yeah, as Laura said, this is household experiences with uh, rooftop solar and electric vehicles uh, in Lethbridge, so southern Alberta. Um, I'm not going to be presenting very much on um, kind of the, the global implications or national legislative uh, context. This really is just a, a personal perspective. Now, as such, um, it's not uh, scientific uh, experimentation, um, but I will present a little bit of data on our experience. So it will be presented in a, in a scientific context. And um, yeah, it's very personal. I'm very biased. I'm passionate about this. So uh, whether it's impartial is debatable, um, but hopefully it can help you um, formulate your own opinions about these aspects of renewables. Now, uh, just a little bit about me. I am not a uh, solar or electric vehicle research, so that's not what I do. Um, this is the kind of thing I do. I use uh, airborne and uh, terrestrial and satellite remote sensing, primarily lasers and LIDAR, uh, to uh, monitor ecosystem changes, whether they're glacial, whether it's uh, snowpack water resources, or whether it's uh, uh, in partnership with LoRa, wildfire and uh, biomass and forest research. There's a number of themes, but it's all basically utilizing uh, remote sensing. And um, also, uh, I do a lot of field work using hydrometeorological equipment. So some of you, I'm sure, have skied at the castle. Um, <clears throat> the weather station equipment there is a mixture of ours from the University of Lethbridge and their own. Um, but what is telemetered online is, is our equipment. And so uh, this is one of my stations out of the field station at the castle. Uh, this is their telecommunication tower, but we have a lot of equipment on there. And all of it is telemetered back to our university. And we've got this website where we uh, share the information. So not a solar researcher, nor an EV researcher, but a little bit of a techie. And I enjoy uh, playing with uh, this kind of technology and this kind of data. And so maybe this has given me some insights into um, being able to uh, understand and work with the, uh, these renewable technologies. Okay, so for a bit of context, here is a slide that illustrates an investor's perspective on large scale solar. So this is not necessarily the homeowner's, home, homeowner's perspective. Uh, this might be the kind of information that investors trying to wonder where they should put their funds or, or how uh, planning for a new utility um, uh, you know, the direction it should going. Uh, and so what this shows us is that over the last decade or so, we've seen a rapid decrease in, in solar energy costs, you know, the manufacturing costs and the general profitability of, uh, of utility scale solar relative to coal and gas. And so I, if we projected this into the future, I'm sure we would see that solar is still uh, cheaper. Now, of course, there's a lot of inertia in any energy generation system. And so just because on a, a megawatt by megawatt basis, solar is a more cost effective solution um, does not mean uh, that it can easily be scaled and, and that we can convert to solar overnight, of course. There's a, there's a lot of momentum in the system, a lot of power generating stations already online. Uh, there are concerns over base load. Um, you know, like, as we know, the sun doesn't shine in the day. And so it will mitigate that. So there's a lot of reasons why um, we, we, we haven't suddenly switched uh, to solar overnight. Um, but in terms of costs, it is now a very cost competitive uh, source of, of energy generation. Uh, OK, that's a little bit about silent solar. Now, what about uh, the engineering context behind um, internal combustion engines? Uh, this was a meme I picked up off of Facebook uh, a week or so ago. So to be honest, I'm not sure it's 100% accurate. And there's certainly uh, an agenda here. So you can imagine that there's some uh, propaganda underlying this meme. But anyway, uh, it is uh, it is true. Um, the numbers may be a little bit debatable. But here is a 120 horsepower electric motor. Here is a 120 horsepower internal combustion engine. Yes, you can get more compact and efficient internal combustion engines that don't look as archaic and horrible as that one. Um, but anyway, they're comparable in terms of the power. Uh, big difference in weight, so you know, fourfold difference in weight. But the most important elements are probably these two pieces here. An electric motor, by virtue of having one major moving part, the central axis and the electrical coils wrapped around that axis, um, it's very highly efficient. It may not always be 95% efficient. That's a number pulled from this site, but they are very efficient. Uh, whereas internal combustion engines have got hundreds, literally hundreds, possibly thousands of moving parts, small moving parts, big moving parts, there's friction, there's a lot of heat energy generated. I mean, basically, what this type of engine is, is uh, 
thousands of controlled experiments occurring every second. <clears throat> and, and so as a, as a result of that process, you're wasting a lot of heat, right? Because not all of that fuel and heat energy can go into efficient uh, movement to propel a vehicle forwards. Whereas the vast majority of energy, energy in an electric motor, uh, largely by virtue of its simplicity and the fact that it isn't um, controlled explosions, um, can efficiently convert energy into motion. Whereas this is an inefficient way to convert energy into, into motion. So instantly, well, why aren't we all driving EVs? Again, same reason we're not all adopting renewable energies. There's inertia in the system and it takes a lot of time to transition. It's not something you can do overnight. Um, but it is worth bearing in mind that in terms of costs and in terms of uh, fundamental engineering, um, solar power is cost effective. Uh, EVs are uh, an engineering marvel relative to uh, what they're replacing. Uh, okay, so that leads to where, why aren't we doing this? Well, this presentation isn't going to answer that question. Hopefully, we've already got some ideas as to why that is the case. Um, but what I want to do is focus on our own, uh, you know, our personal experience with this in our household. So in uh, this is a picture from 2013. We just put our new shed in. And I don't know if the Zoom bar is covering this, but you can see one of my solar panels here. The idea was I wanted to electrify my shed and make it somewhat self-sufficient. So I've got two solar panels, an inverter, and a, an array of banks, so four uh, deep cycle uh, batteries uh, in there. And so I can run power tools in there. I can uh, uh, light up the shed and um, power some other uh, functions within, within the backyard. Um, now, uh, because I'm a little bit of a techie and have access to the uh, resources, I also put a radiometer on there to monitor the incoming radiation. Um, and I've got a data logger hooked up to the uh, the batteries and, and the charger system. So I can monitor the incoming shortwave radiation and I can monitor temperature and I can monitor the, the state of battery charge. And so this is what we see. Here's our annual variation in incoming shortwave radiation. Uh, this was a 2014, 2015, so a year after we installed this system. And for nine months of the year, we've got, uh, you know, the batteries maintain their charge. Uh, but of course, winter is a bit of a problem. You know, um, the batteries just naturally uh, decline because the state of charge uh, does not compensate for the rate of discharge during that time. So that, that is a little bit of a problem for us as far as the, as far as the shed is concerned, but we don't really use the shed that much in the winter, so not really a problem. Anyway, uh, based on this experience in uh, 2017, uh, we thought, you know what, I'd, I'd like to scale this up a little bit and put solar on the house. So at a cost to us of $9,500, we installed these uh, solar panels. It's a 3.2 uh, kilowatt system. It wasn't intended to bring our house quite to net zero, um, but it was going to get us most of the way there. Uh, then uh, a year later, um, based on, or 18 months later, uh, based on our experience with this, we, we liked it, thought it was worthwhile. And then for about $3,500, we were able to almost double our array to 6.2 kilowatts. Now, these numbers don't mean a whole heck of a lot right now, but, but that 6.2 kilowatts um, should, at the time, uh, theoretically make our house net zero. And so that was the plan. Now, the good thing about these technologies is, uh, and because you know, I'm a scientist, I love data, uh, they allow us to monitor what's happening with the system in real time. So we can monitor each one of our individual solar panels. We get readouts of uh, energy consumption and en sorry, energy generation. Uh, distributed by the uh, inverter, the individual strings and the individual panels. I'm not going to get into any more technicalities on that, but it's a lot of data and, and, and we can play with that. Uh, and, and importantly, if there's a problem with one of the panels, we know about it right away. Um, but this is more intuitively uh, interesting and, and valuable information. So here's the total uh, daily uh, generation through real time, you know, throughout the day, uh, on a winter day and on a summer's day. And so this is a, a fairly nice uh, cloud-free trace. So we've got around about 40 kilowatt hours of power generation during the you know, middle of the day and midsummer. And you can see it's a nice clean trace, starts about six in the morning and ends around eight in the evening. And so that's kind of an ideal situation. Uh, in winter, we're obviously dealing with lower peak. So here we're over five kilowatts, here we're below four kilowatts, but actually not that different in the peak. The big difference is it's a shorter day. Uh, and then of course, there are other things to uh, factor in, you know, cloud cover is gonna change that trace. So even on summer, if we get a cloudy day, of course, it's gonna drop that, that energy trace. Um, but these numbers are, are important. So 15 kilowatt hours during the day in winter is fairly typical. 
um, 40 kilowatt in the summer, again, fairly typical for a clear day. Uh, incidentally, our house, the average consumption is 20 kilowatt hours per day. So in winter, um, it's rare that the solar would generate as much energy as our house consumes. But during the summer, we're often generating more than double what our house consumes. So, so those are important statistics to bear in mind. Now, and I often get asked about winter and, and what happens when the panels get covered in snow. Uh, well, yeah, they can get uh, buried, particularly these on our, uh, on our uh, lower roof because there's a wall behind it, so the snow can kind of pile up. Uh, those on the upper roof, they tend to clear off pretty quickly. I mean, the, <laughs> the one benefit of being in a windy town um, is that the snow doesn't stick around in one place for very long. It tends to blow off. So we're usually not without any sun for a day or two. Uh, and the upper panels are the reason for that. They tend to blow off. Uh, the lower panels, however, uh, they do blow off or they melt off eventually, but they often need a little bit of help from me. So you can see from here, I can get to these panels from my bedroom window and bathroom window. And so I can sweep them off using a snow rake uh, or from, from the ground, I can use a, a snow rake to pull the, the, the snow off. So in about 10 minutes of work, I can easily clear the, uh, the lower panels, um, but I have to rely on the wind for the upper panels. Uh, now, so this is what a typical winter and a summer month might look like. So you can see even during the summer, we're not getting that 40 kilowatts every day. Well, these would be cloudy days or smoky days. That's been a bit of a problem for us lately. Um, but during the summer, we can be generating over one megawatt hour. Now, that's quite a lot of energy. And then uh, during the winter, we're typically around this 200 kilowatt hour range. Um, but of course, we suffer days where we may have no solar power at all. And I think here is probably the worst case scenario where we've lost four days continuously. And I don't know exactly what happened beyond that. Um, but to be honest, it, it would be very rare that we would go four days without any kind of power, um, because what that tells you is I'm being lazy and I'm not clearing off my lower panels. Um, normally, I would do that. Um, but typically, one or two days uh, is about the most we would lose any kind of solar generation capacity. Now, looking at this at the annual scale, of course, we can see that annual trace. This is what we expect peak solar in the summer, minimal in the winter, around about 200 versus around about one megawatt, so a five-fold difference. Um, but here's our average, our average, uh, sorry, yes, the average monthly generation is, uh, is here about 677, so that's about here. So we're actually above the average for uh, more than half of the year, um, but the lowest months are pretty bad, right? January and December are, are particularly bad. We're way below uh, our needs in those two months. But here's where we're at over the last year. So we generated eight megawatts uh, and our household use was 8.6 megawatts, which is actually reasonably high. And I'll show you why in a minute. Um, but what it's worth bearing in mind is that energy generation capacity is equivalent to uh, saving three tons of, uh, of emissions to the atmosphere from fossil fuels. Now, of course, that's going to vary whether it's coal or gas, um, but that's the generally accepted um, amount of tons of CO2 saved. Um, based on grid level averages. And, and that varies uh, from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Um, in Alberta, of course, we've got to be 11% um, wind, uh, two or 3% solar, and those numbers are, are increasing. So as the grid gets cleaner, then we'll save less and less energy. Um, but a few years ago, when the grid was mostly coal, uh, we would have actually saved a lot more than three tons. So anyway, that's a moving target, but we've, we've saved quite a bit of uh, CO2 as a result of this micro generation. So we're almost net zero, but not quite. Now, uh, okay, I, I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more in a minute, but I wanna quickly shift to EVs because uh, in our household, it's all part of a combined system. The use of EVs and the solar generation are kind of uh, tightly coupled to one another. Um, so just a little bit of general statistics there. If we look at uh, 2021 Chevy Bolt, it's a fairly, uh, mid-range um, generic uh, EV, uh, and after rebate, it's about $30,000. Yeah, that's cheap for a small to mid-sized run, sorry, not cheap, <laughs> for a small to mid-sized runaround. Um, you know, you're paying about a $10,000 premium there, and uh, 470 kilometers range, 66 kilowatt hour battery, just to give you some stats. Um, however, pretty impressive warranty, 160,000 kilometer warranty, um, but the cost of that vehicle is going to vary depending on where you are in Canada. <clears throat> so those are the last year's statistics. I honestly don't know what they are today. Uh, it's a moving target. These things constantly uh, change with, uh, with every budget. So maybe that's not where they are right now, but that's where they were last year. Now, so our personal experience, 
uh, was that we didn't want to buy a brand new EV. Uh, our first EV was going to be our second vehicle. We had a Honda Accord hybrid as our main vehicle. So we'd already kind of slightly moved down the uh, uh, you know energy efficient uh, path by, by driving a hybrid. Um, but we really wanted to explore what it would be like to have an EV. So our second, you know, being a two car household, our, our second vehicle was, uh, we had some flexibility to play around. So we bought this little secondhand uh, four door um, Chevy Spark. Uh, almost 30,000 kilometers on the clock. It was three years old, very small, 18.4 kilowatt hour battery. And that gave us about 150 kilometers of uh, summertime range, around 80 kilometers of wintertime range. Uh, it did not have fast charge capability. So we could only charge it at home using a level two or 240 volt um, power supply uh, off our uh, circuit. And it would take us around about five hours to charge it. So overnight charging, no problem, um, but we're landlocked. Right. I mean, Lethbridge is kind of its own little island in southern Alberta. We couldn't really go much further than, you know, Tabor or maybe Fort McLeod. Yeah. But beyond that, uh, you're, you're stuck to uh, just local uh, commutes, which is fine, though, for us as a second vehicle for driving in and out of work and doing grocery shopping. No problem at all. Now, that car consumed 22 percent of our overall household electricity. So for the first year we own that, our energy consumption really increased. So some of the pros and cons, uh, no gas, right? Fuel it up at home, uh, very low fuel costs. And I'll show you the difference in fuel costs in a minute. Instant torque, you know, you put your foot on the gas pedal, you instantly take off. So uh, many people don't realize that, but EVs are actually uh, a lot of fun and quite fast to drive. <clears throat> Charge at home, so we don't have to stop at gas stations. No oil changes. Uh, regenerative brakes means that as we're slowing down, going downhill, we're actually putting energy back into the battery. So that's handy with a uh, regular internal combustion engine, of course, when you're slowing down or going downhill, all of that energy is just being lost as heat uh, to the atmosphere. Uh, no emissions during idling, but the cons, limited range with this kind of car and purchase price is definitely gonna be an in a disincentive. So uh, incidentally, uh, this vehicle with the charger technology, the winter tires, the weather mats, a bit of warranty, uh, were $19,000, okay? That, that is expensive, right, for a, a little uh, runaround car uh, that's already three years old. I'm, I'm not going to pretend that's cheap. Um, however, it, it makes a difference when you start looking at the operating costs, uh, which I'll look at in a minute. <clears throat> we had such a positive experience with the, with the Spark over one year that uh, we're like, oh, wow, we, we sold on this technology, but we don't like the idea that we're landlocked. We want to upgrade to a vehicle where we can actually use it as our primary vehicle, uh, and, you know, go to meetings in Edmonton, have vacations, that kind of thing. So uh, a year later, we, we upgrade, uh, sorry, um, 2020, uh, we upgraded to a 2019 Tesla. So this was also a secondhand vehicle. Uh, it had 12,000 kilometers on the clock, it was uh, under a year old, uh, but now much bigger battery, 75 kilowatt hour battery, a uh, claimed range of over 500 kilometers. And now all of a sudden we can do fast charging on the, on the, on the road. So, you know, every now and again, you'll see these kind of charges. More and more of them are coming online all the time. Um, and so we can charge uh, whilst we're out on trips now. <clears throat> that's, that's extremely important because it gave us the freedom to use this as our primary vehicle. And that's what it is now. The Tesla is our primary vehicle for everyday use and trips. Now, and just kind of as a fun aside, uh, I've, I'm so sold on EV technology that I also uh, sold my old Triumph Tiger adventure bike and, uh, and purchased uh, an electric bike. Um, I can't go as far as my Tiger, but I can certainly have a lot of fun on this bike. So anyway, that's just an aside. I won't tell, give you any stats on this, but, uh, but you can even electrify your, uh, your ride these days. <clears throat> okay, so um, first thing, I can charge all of these technologies at home. So they're consuming household energy. Right. So this is where this system is connected to our solar system. Right. The, so whatever we generate in terms of solar power and consume as part of our household living power. Uh, now we have to factor in the vehicles because that power is being used to drive us to, to work every day, to do grocery shopping and so on and so forth. So it's, it's tight. All of these systems are now tightly integrated. Now, one of the really neat things about the uh, EV technology, and you can tell them, I sound like a salesperson now. I'm really trying to sell you on it. I'm not trying to sell you. I'm just passionate about this stuff. I, you know, I, I enjoy this, uh, this technology because it's really working out for us. Um, but one of the neat things about EVs is that they've all got uh, quite sophisticated monitoring technology and you get real-time feedback. 
So this is from the, the Spark. Now, bear in mind, this is a 2015 technology, so it's actually pretty old now. Um, but we can monitor the, the bat state of charge on the battery. We can monitor real-time power inputs, real-time power regeneration. Um, that's something you can't do with most internal combustion engines. You know, you can see what the real-time energy usage is, but it's kind of averaged over a period of time. Uh, with the EVs, it's instantaneous. You can get that, that information right away. Now, uh, the, the, the Tesla Model 3s, you know, Got very similar stuff, different um, display, but similar kind of information. So you can see the battery state of charge there. Um, <clears throat> one of the things I want to point out, of course, is that you've got summer efficiency on the Spark. We were averaging through the summer 12 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers. During the winter, we we're averaging 23 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers. So, you know, it, almost uh, doubling in, uh, in winter. So what that tells us is we're consuming almost twice the amount of energy in winter. Now, you think about an internal combustion engine. Um, yes, you, we all know that there is a loss of energy efficiency uh, as you go from summer to winter. Um, but is it a doubling of energy consumption? Hmm. I don't know. We'd have to look at the stats. But my gut feeling is you don't quite lose that much efficiency when you go from summer to winter driving into an internal combustion engine. You know, maybe you lose some between 10 and 50 percent. I don't know. But it's not this this much of a noticeable drop. Well, okay, here's the reason for that. Um, the EV is just fundamentally more efficient in the first place. It, you know, you're, you're fundamentally um, converting more of the energy from the battery into propulsion of the vehicle. And so because it's already efficient, you're not losing a lot of waste heat. Now, whereas in the winter, energy that would be wasted from the internal combustion engine is being used to heat the cabin and, and you know heat other parts of the vehicle that may be needed. Um, and so that's why you don't see such a loss in efficiency because it's already so damned inefficient to begin with, right? The internal combustion engine is just wasting so much heat that if you want to scavenge some of that heat to heat the internal uh, cabin, um, you're not actually losing that much. So yes, we see a drop off in energy efficiency, but it's not as drastic as a drop off of energy efficiency as it is with an EV. So that is something to understand. The reason you see this big change is because it is fundamentally more efficient in the first place. Um, and we do have to condition the battery, you know, keep it within certain temperature ranges that consumes energy. Uh, and when you turn on a heater matrix, of course, uh, that's an electro, uh, sorry, a resistive electric uh, heater matrix. Again, that's pulling straight from the battery. So when the cabin heat is cranked inside an EV, um, your efficiency is just going to go down. It's just something you uh, learn to live with. <clears throat> uh, okay, so uh, time trace of uh, energy from the um, Tesla. Uh, so while we're on the road, uh, of course, we, uh, we need to stop and charge up. And this is something I get asked about a lot. Uh, yeah, it takes a bit longer than uh, pulling a gas pump and sticking the nozzle in the tank and filling it up. You know, that's maybe a five or 10 minute job, depending. Uh, yeah, it's gonna take longer with the EV. Um, minimally, I think a, a minimal stop, if it's just a quick top up is gonna to be 10 to 15 minutes. Um, maximally, if we're on a, a relatively slow DC fast charger, because there's different rates of charge, uh, you know, the, the most we've ever spent charging is about an hour. Um, and that would be at a fairly low rate. And um, when we've got to fill up the entire battery, uh, so somewhere between 10 minutes and one hour is the, is the, is the range, but typically uh, a, a stop for a charge is around about half an hour. 20 minutes or half an hour would be our typical stop time for a charge. Plenty of time to run in and get a coffee, um, go to the bathroom, whatever you need to do. And if you're only doing that every four or 500 kilometers, it's really not that big of a deal. Uh, and as the charge infrastructure gets better, um, it's just getting more and more convenient. It can be inconvenient. I'm not going to pretend it, it can, can be a pain sometimes, um, but it's getting easier all the time. Okay, so some uh, stats on, on costs. So I've already mentioned that the, there is a premium to buy the EVs, of course. That's something we have to bear in mind. Um, but let's ignore that for the time being. Let's just look at running costs. So this is for the Spark for our first year of ownership in 2019. So this is a whole year. Uh, I literally spent less than $10, and that was on screen wash. Uh, I, okay, I wash the car as well, but you know, that's I'm, I'm just thinking of consumables here. So, you know, ten dollars for screen wash plus washing the car. That was the only maintenance. Uh, insurance was the same as for the Honda Civic. Uh, I was actually pleasantly surprised. I thought we'd pay a premium for insurance, but we didn't. Um, annual energy costs. Well, we 
drove 9,500 kilometers. The average energy consumption of 16.8 kilowatt hours, that's from the car. The car told us we had used 16.8 kilowatt hours. Uh, and, and so that translated to $220. And, and that was based on the grid cost for energy of 13.9 cents per kilowatt hour. And I got that number from my bills. So there's the cost for energy, cost for transmission, put it all together, amortize it over the year for the amount of energy generate, uh, consumed from the grid. This was the cost. Uh, reverse way to do it is to uh, use uh, our monitoring. I've got monitoring on the house, so I could monitor the actual amount of energy that went into the car. Um, and that came at 16, 13 kilowatt hours, which is different to what the car told me, which was 1596 kilowatts, but they're both, you know, 1600 kilowatts, very, very similar. Uh, same cost for energy, 224. So whichever way you look at it, we're in the $220 range to drive the vehicle. But here's the other thing to bear in mind, half of our energy in that year um, that went into charging was 50% solar, or around about 50%, probably more, but around about 50% solar. So the actual cost is closer to 1.2 cents per kilometer. But what does that mean in terms of uh, savings relative to an internal combustion engine? <clears throat> well, I know from my records from my Honda Civic that around town, on average, during the year, I'd be getting nine liters per 100 kilometers. As for year-round city community, yes, you can do better when you're driving on the highway. I get that. Uh, but for round town driving, summer and winter, it averaged out at nine liters. And that's actually pretty good for an internal combustion engine. Very often you'll see more than that. Um, but, you know, this is this is comparable to the, the type of vehicle and the type of driving. Now, um, at the time, price of gas was around about 110. It's about 140 now. And uh, so if you compute it through kilometers multiplied by the amount of uh, liters used per 100 kilometers, uh, $1.10, that equates to just over $1,000 in gas or 11 cents per kilometer. So in summary, driving our Spark, just driving it around was 10 to 20% the cost of a comparable internal combustion engine for the same kind of driving. So already we've seen a massive saving on, uh, on, on driving costs. Okay, now I've got 11 months of data for the Model 3. Actually, we've had the Model 3 for two years now, but, but I have 11 months of data where I've actually logged it and I can uh, track it. So I know, for example, based on our variable grid costs, um, that I've spent over $300 charging the Model 3 over the last 11 months. In truth, it's probably a lot less than this. Um, but anyway, I'm, I'm trying to be conservative so that my arguments are reasonable. So uh, about $300 for home charging and then fast charging, that's, all read, that's also logged uh, around just under $100. So put it all together, we've spent around about $400 um, putting energy in the battery uh, of the EV. <clears throat> now that is for local driving and for distance driving. And this ratio can give you some idea, around about 20% uh, of our overall use has been out of town, you know, on, on the highway. So I've done almost 13,000 kilometers over the last 11 months. The rate of energy consumption is 21.6 kilowatt hours per 100. Now that is five kilowatt hours more than the Spark. But the reason for that is we, we're doing a lot more highway driving, a lot more winter driving. In, I mean, it, we spent a week in Banff and we, the drive up there it was minus 37 plus wind. So we're probably dealing with minus 40 to minus, minus 50 with wind chill uh, temperatures. And, and we drove you know, a few hundred kilometers in that. No problem, but you are consuming a lot more energy when you're doing that. Um, anyway, so with the solar, we're down about two cents per kilometer. So a little bit more than the Spark, but still pretty cheap. Now at today's rate in the Civic, that would be 14 cents per kilometer. So seven times less than, uh, than the Civic or somewhere between 15 to 23% of the driving costs of a Honda Civic. Uh, okay, so, so everything I've said so far is about the energy consumption uh, and, and generation, but I want to talk about CO2 footprint because that's going to, uh, you know, this is where it becomes relevant within, you know, the green uh, discussion uh, context. So when we're burning gas in an internal combustion engine vehicle, we are mixing uh, the atoms of carbon and oxygen to form CO2. Uh, now, this is where you're just going to have to believe me on this, because otherwise it would be a chemistry class. Um, we don't want to go there right now. But anyway, uh, if, if you dig into the literature, one liter of gasoline uh, is a equates to around about 2.3 kilos of CO2. 
<clears throat> so that's CO2 in the atmosphere. Now, for almost 13,000 kilometers of uh, driving in the Civic, uh, we can do the calculation uh, you know, based on um, uh, liters per 100 kilometers uh, and the amount of um, CO2 per liter, right? We can calculate that out. That gives us 2.6 tons of CO2. It's actually not a hard calculation to do. Um, so there you go, two, two and a half tons of CO2 um, for just less than one year of driving a Honda Civic. Uh, okay, now, but the difficulty for us in terms of understanding what that means in terms of the Tesla's CO2 footprint for those same 1,200 or 12,000 uh, kilometers or so is we need to know how, uh, how green the grid is, you know, how much, um, how, how, what is the quantity of CO2 emission associated with one kilowatt hour generated on the grid? Truth is, I don't know what it is for Alberta. Uh, I do know that, that, as I mentioned earlier, we've got 11%, uh, I think, wind energy generation and maybe 2 or 3% solar energy generation. So it does have a green component, but it still also has some coal and, and quite a bit of natural gas, natural gas being the big one. Um, so it's not green by any stretch. There is a considerable amount of emission, uh, CO2 emission associated with our grid power. Um, but I don't know what those numbers are. And, and maybe someone else could dig into that a little bit. Um, so for reference, I use the US EPA number. Um, and here's the link for that. And they quoted 0.48 kilos of CO2 per kilowatt hour generated. And that is highly variable around the world. Like you'll see some jurisdictions where it's, you know, way more than one kilo and others where it's maybe down your know, 0.1 kilo. So, you know, you can have an order of magnitude or more difference in this number. So it is, it is highly debatable. Uh, but anyway, using the US EPA average, what that tells us is for the amount of energy it took to drive those miles, um, we use in around about 1.3 tons of CO2. So instantly uh, the Model 3 is consuming, sorry, not consuming, is emitting or responsible uh, for half the emissions of an internal combustion engine. In truth, I'm confident it's lower than that, but it's, you know, those are the numbers. Uh, and I, actually, some of the videos I've watched on this, the numbers tend to come in a lot lower than mine, but I'm trying to be uh, objective and I'm trying to give the Honda Civic, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, a fair crack, um, but it just, it just can't compete. Um, now, in our case, you know, from our own personal household perspective, half of that energy is coming from the sun and the zero emissions associated with the energy that we're generating. So it's really 0.65 tons of CO2 from our Tesla in terms of energy consumption. So we're around about 25% the operational CO2 footprint. Now, I have not discussed energy associated with manufacturing. We've not discussed the emissions associated with manufacturing. We haven't discussed rare earth minerals and natural resource extraction associated with manufacturing. And yes, there's a lot of question marks over how green uh, EVs are uh, in terms of the manufacturing. However, if you dig into the literature, you'll find that um, they still work out greener, especially when you factor in uh, the whole life cycle. You know, like on the day that you purchase a Model 3 from the lot versus the day that you purchase, let's say, I don't know, Honda Accord uh, from the lot, the Honda Accord might, might be a little bit greener um, simply because of the manufacturing workflow that's been implemented and, and, the, and the efficiencies in a system that are so, so large scale. But EVs, you know, the production right now are relatively small. Um, and, and so because of the smaller scale um, workflow that's involved, it, it's going to be less efficient today. But as that scales up, it will become more and more efficient. And sometime fairly soon, uh, the manufacturing of EVs will probably become greener than the manufacturing of internal combustion engines. I mean, it really does stand to reason when you look at the simplicity of the engineering by comparison. So it, it's kind of a scale issue. We're not at that scale of efficiency yet, but we will get there at some point. And, and then, of course, there are issues about rare earth minerals and lithium and so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, the um, inefficiencies and the emissions associated with uh, uh, oil and gas extraction are, are not exactly clean. So you've always got to compare like for like. Uh, okay, now our household uh, has all kinds of monitoring on it. I'm not going to get into depth on that, but we have lots of monitoring. Uh, so I can, I can look at other parts of our uh, household consumption. So one thing I do want to look at is that... Um, in September 2019, I replaced our gas water heater with a, 
an energy efficient hybrid electric water heater. Now, most people, most homeowners are going to say, oh, electric water heaters, they suck compared to gas water heaters. And in some ways they maybe do. Um, and, and if you look at the dollar for dollar costs, uh, yeah, it's, there, I think there's a good argument for gas heaters in, in terms of cost, in terms of the operational cost. Um, but I'm not going to get into that debate. The, only, the debate I'm interested in right now is, is the energy efficiency of them. Costs, I've actually worked out, it really doesn't make a lot of difference for us in terms of the, uh, the, the energy use costs for gas versus the energy use costs for electricity. Um, I could talk about that uh, if someone wants, but that's not really where I intend to go with this right now. Um, but anyway, it's got a heat pump, which makes it hyper efficient. It scavenges excess heat from the energy around it. So that's what makes it very efficient. Um, it, it is supposed to have a lower CO2 footprint than gas. And so that's what I wanted to look into. Um, and one of the neat um, byproducts of this system is that it can assist with summertime cooling of the house uh, if you want. And that was actually valuable for us because we don't have air conditioning in our house. We don't feel like we need it. Um, but this thing does cool the environment around it. So it, it uh, provides some benefit there. Okay, so some stats. I know from our energy bills that, um, you know, I've tracked our uh, gas consumption over the last few years as well. And I've got three years of data before the hot water tank. And I've got two full years or just over two full years of energy consumption after the tank was installed. And what I've noticed is that our energy consumption has gone down on average by 2.8 megawatts. Yeah, okay, so we've used 10 gigajoules which is the equivalent of 2.8 megawatts. Again, there's another conversion that you have to kind of trust me on. But converting gigajoules to megawatts, I think is like 277 kilowatts per gigajoule. So it works out at 2.8 megawatts. Um, the annual electric hot water tank energy, I know is 0.93 megawatts because I've actually uh, monitored it. Uh, and so for the same amount of work, um, that's the difference in energy use. So this is, but this is gas energy, whereas this is electric energy. So the, the gas versus the electric costs are around about the same. In fact, the gas might even be a little bit cheaper, um, but they're very similar. But the big difference is that our electric energy consumption is 33% that of the gas equivalent. And so therefore uh, its CO2 footprint is also a lot less. Uh, so electric heat pumps are more efficient than gas for water heating. And again, we could talk about that at length, but that really isn't what I'm trying to go with. It's just trying to illustrate that the electric systems are more efficient uh, than the you know, gas and, and, and um, fossil fuel-based systems. Okay, now I'm going to, uh, I got one more slide after this, but this is kind of where I want to leave things. The orange line illustrates our energy consumption from 2016 to the present. And so what we can see uh, from 2016 to 2017, we saved about one megawatt. And the reason for that is because we went on a bit of a binge and increased the efficiency of um, many of our uh, consumptive uh, electric appliances and light bulbs and so on and so forth. So we saved quite a bit of energy just by changing a few things in the house. Uh, then in 2017, we started generating our own energy. <clears throat> for 2018, we generated 3.8 megawatts. We used 4.8 megawatts. So we weren't quite net zero. And then in uh, February 2019, we added the second solar installation. So suddenly, we've dramatically increased our energy generation, and we were beyond net zero now. So in that year, we generated 7.1, consumed 6.6. And this was the first year of our EV as well. So this was with the Spark. So in almost one year of using the Spark, we consumed 1.6 megawatts just to charge the Spark. And you can see that accounts for most of the difference between 2018 and 2019 uh, energy use is because we were now charging the EV, but we were still less uh, than the amount of energy we were generating. Then <clears throat> we added in the hot water tank. So now all of a sudden, now we're generating uh, hot, hot water from, uh, from electricity and shortly after that, we added the Model 3 and most of the charging for that. And so from 19 to 20, we added an extra two megawatts of energy consumption because of the hot water tank and because of the Model 3. Um, and for a full year of solar generation, we were now getting eight megawatts, which has been fairly consistent for the last two years. Um, and also our energy consumption uh, with the hot water tank and the EVs has also been fairly consistent. 8.7 megawatts in uh, 
2020 and 8.6 megawatts in, in 2021. So we've started to even out over the last two years. Now we're not quite net zero. Um, so I'm actually motivated to add some more solar panels and add some batteries, but we're not quite net zero, but we're, we're almost there. So uh, here's my summary from the EV experience. Uh, the Spark was great for commuting, uh, but then when we upgraded the Model 3, uh, the Model 3 became our primary vehicle for everything. If I wanted to drive to Ontario, I'd have no hesitation in doing that. In fact, that'd be kind of a fun trip. Um, the EVs are less than 25% of the operating costs. In fact, for us, it's even less than that because a lot of the energy comes from the sun. Um, so that saves us 1.3 tons of CO2. And now that we've got the Tesla and we do most of our driving, that saves us around about $2,000 a year in gas and probably more than that because there's no servicing either. Now, at Solar Microgen, our annual bills have dropped by 50%. Uh, we're using the solar to also power our vehicle, uh, about 50% of our EV mileage from solar. Um, but here's a downside. The return on the investment for us is about 10 to 20 years on the Solar Microgen. Cost around about thirteen thousand dollars to do the installation, which you know it's, that's a big deal, right? You know, adding solar panels that's not cheap, um, and for us it'll probably take ten to twenty years. In Ontario and in BC and in everywhere in Europe, it would take a lot less time to recover that initial investment. Uh, bottom line is the Alberta incentives and, and um, cost structure for energy is not really set up to incentivize incentivize uh, homeowner energy uh, uh, contributions to the grid. But it is what it is. Uh, we did it for the green aspects, and we've saved about three tons of CO2. But incidentally, we've saved about $500 per year. So overall, yes, initial, initial investment costs for an EV are high. You know, right? You're paying a ten dollars to $20,000 premium at today's rates. Rebates don't quite get you all the way down to cost parity with an internal car, um, combustion engine. Um, so you've got to pay the premium. Um, Payback on a car and payback on a solar system today are on the order of the decade scale, right? For us, for the cars, it's probably five to 10 years um, in terms of getting, you know, recuperating that 10 to $20,000 premium. Um, and the solar system, it could be as much as 20 years. So decadal scale. But the bottom line, line is we're saving four and a half tons of CO2 per year. So it's green living. So I know maybe uh, we don't have a lot of time left, but uh, thank you. I'm happy to take any questions now.